when I'm done here tonight with this session, with the second session, uh, Zach's going to come up and read the questions you guys have texted to that number, and uh, we'll just discuss those questions, okay? So that's how we're going to do the questions for tonight. The second thing I want to say is that there's going to be a little bit of repetition now in the second section, because what I'm going to do is talk to you about how the different parts of the Bible fit into that story that we just talked about in our first session. But, but before I do that, I do just want to remind you of this, of how absolutely unique the Bible is, how absolutely unique it is among all the books that have ever been written. Now look, I know that other religions have their holy books. We're not ignorant of this. This isn't the only book that claims to be a holy book. But there are things that are absolutely unique about the Bible that in my mind are strong evidences, compelling evidences that it's worthy of its trust. First of all, I would say that the Bible, among all the books in the world, is unique in its continuity. This book was written over a period of at least 1,600 years, over 60 generations. It was written by more than 40 authors on three different continents. It was written in different circumstances and in different places, in different times, in different moods. It was written in three different languages, and it's written on scores of the most controversial subjects that human beings have ever discussed. And it speaks with beautiful and powerful continuity and unanimity throughout the whole book. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. A mark of divine inspiration. The Bible's also unique, not only in its continuity, but it's unique in its circulation. It is by far the most published and popular book ever, ever published. It's unique in its translation. The Bible was the first book translated, as far as we know, and it has been translated into more languages by far than any other book in existence. The Bible is unique in its survival. It has survived the ravages of time, of being copied by hand, it's survived the ravages of persecution and even the criticism of its fiercest skeptics. That's not all, though. The Bible's also unique in its honesty. The Bible, unique, especially among pieces of ancient literature, it deals with the failings and the sins of even its heroes with tremendous honesty and straightforwardness. It's unique in its influence. The Bible has had, I would say, far and away a greater influence on culture and literature than any other book in existence. For those reasons alone, I think every person should study the Bible. I don't care if you're a rank pagan. I'll be honest with you. I don't know why, well, I do know why, but I don't know why, why the Bible isn't taught in our schools. This book is by far the most influential book on Western civilization and therefore the world ever published. Why shouldn't people know it? Why shouldn't people know where the foundations of Western civilization find so many of their roots back to? Now, this amazing, remarkable book has a remarkable character. We talk about this being a book, but you and I know that it's really much more accurate, perhaps, to describe it as a library. It's a collection of 66 books, and those books are generally divided into two sections, the Hebrew Scriptures and the Greek Scriptures. We often call the Hebrew Scriptures the Old Testament. We often call the Greek Scriptures the New Testament. Although, let me get a little bit technical with you here. There's a few chapters in what we call the Old Testament that are not written in Hebrew 
They're written in Aramaic. It's just a few chapters, but there's a few chapters. That's why we can say the Bible was written in three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and a little bit of Aramaic. So what we have is we have this separation between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures and the Greek Scriptures. Now, if you're going to talk about the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, then you're talking about three different kinds of books. You could almost say, uh, I I found this great chart, this uh, periodic chart of the Bible that sort of presents it like this. I thought this was a very clever way to present it. It divides up the Bible as if the periodic charts of elements. But to me, this is sort of a catchy and a meaningful way to understand this. So first you have, according to this graphic, on the right side you have the New Testament, on the left side you have the Old Testament. Let's talk about the Old Testament first. First you have what you might call the historic books of the Old Testament. That's that group up at the top. There's a special place for the first five historic books. Those were written by Moses, often called the first five books of Moses, or the Pentateuch. Then you have the following books all the way from Joshua through Esther, the historic books of the, New, of the Old Testament. Then after the historic books, then you have the poetic books of the New Testament. Very different kind of literature in the poetic books. There you're talking about Job, you're talking about Psalms, you're talking about Proverbs, you're talking about the Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes, those making up the wisdom or poetic books of the Old Testament. And then finally, you have the prophetic books separated into two categories. You have the major prophets, as you can see, that's Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. The major prophets, and then you have the minor prophets, the blue ones down there at the bottom, Hosea all the way through Malachi. Those are the rough divisions of the Old Testament books. Now, I need to tell you something about this library that we have of the Bible. Some people are shocked to hear that someone like me understands the Bible literally. Well, you read the Bible? Well, yes, I do. Do do you take it literally? Well, of course I do. How else are you going to take it? Now, understand what we mean when we say we take the Bible literally. We mean this, that we understand it according to its literary context. So when the Bible speaks historically, that's the top books, it's true history. When it speaks poetically or with wisdom literature, it's true poetry and wisdom. When it speaks prophetically, it's true prophecy. You do have to understand it according to its genre of literature. For example, and I use this example so often, I should know the chapter and verse, but I just always forget it at the moment. In the Psalms, David prays. He says, Lord, I made my bed swim with tears. Now, do you believe the Bible literally? Of course I believe it literally. Well, then that must mean that you believe David cried so much that his bed was floating in his room on a pool of tears because he cried so much. I mean, what would that be about, I don't know, a hundred gallons of water or something like that? You say, well, I object to that thought because I don't think it's possible for a human being to cry a hundred gallons worth of tears, you know, on and on. Listen, dear friend, you understand the Bible according to its literary context. Everybody understands what David's saying there in the Psalms. He was crying his eyes out. There's another literary form of speech there. You don't want somebody to take that in the wrong way, do you? We use these figures of speech all the time. And that's just understanding what literature is and how literature works. So yes, we take the Bible literally. We take it as true 
according to its literary context. It's really that simple. It doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. But this is why it's so important to understand the different genres or categories of literature. And we saw it now in the Old Testament, didn't we? What are the different categories of literature in the Old Testament? There's the historical books, the wisdom or poetic books, and then there's the prophets divided into the major prophets and the minor prophets. Okay, now what do we have when we come to the New Testament? Well, in the New Testament, we have something different. History made its flow all the way through the Old Testament. You see, if you were to start at the top with the flow of history from the Old Testament, you would have the beginnings in Genesis. As I told you, Act 1 would be Genesis chapter 1 through 11. Just right up there, uh, 11 chapters of that first square, that's Act 1. But then you have, in the rest of the book of Genesis, the story of the patriarchs. Who are the patriarchs? Well, I told you. Who did we start with in Genesis chapter 12? Abraham, his son Isaac, his son Jacob, and then the 12 sons of Jacob, and don't forget his one daughter. 12 sons and one daughter, the tribes of Israel. Those were the patriarchs, and that's where we end the book of Genesis. Then we have Egypt and the Exodus. That takes up the four books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I'm kind of fascinated with how that works out. They leave Egypt in the book of Exodus, and they come to Mount Sinai in the middle of the book. I think it's about chapter 19. They come to Mount Sinai. They stay at Mount Sinai from Exodus chapter 19 all the way through the rest of the book of Exodus, all the way through Leviticus, and up through the first 11 or 12 chapters of the book of Numbers. All of that is at Mount Sinai. Then in the middle of the book of Numbers, they head out from Mount Sinai, and they spend 38 more years in the wilderness, all the way through the end of the book of Deuteronomy, leading us to the book of Joshua when they're ready to come into the promised land. Joshua describes the entrance into the promised land. You've got these three books, Joshua, Judges, and Ruth, which basically describe for us what life was like during the time of the conquest and then the period of Judges afterwards, which I told you lasted for 400 years. Following on after that, you have the rise and the fall of Israel's kingdoms. That's in 1st and 2nd Samuel. 1st and 2nd Samuel encompass the reigns of Saul and David. Then into 1st Kings, you have basically, you have the very end of David's reign in 1st Kings, but basically you have the reign of Solomon and his descendants, and then you have that following through into 2nd Kings, the story of that. Now, 1st and 2nd Chronicles up here on your chart those are interesting as well because First and Second Chronicles tell essentially the same story as Second Samuel through Second Kings, but they tell it from more a priestly perspective. It's an interesting way to correlate those two different histories. They're not different. They're very complementary histories, what you find in Kings and in Chronicles. But as I told you, at the end of the book of 2 Kings, at the end of the book of 2 Chronicles, Jerusalem is destroyed, the temple is burned, they're sent away into exile. And what happens after 70 years of Babylonian exile? God allows them to come back into the land. That's where you have the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. And then the prophetic books of the minor prophets that go along with that post-exilic period. Now, there's one thing that I didn't talk about, and that is the prophets. When you see the green books there under the Old Testament, the prophets there, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel, those take place all the way through the books of First and Second Kings. 
as well as the lower ones, which take place through First and Second Kings, and then the last three happen when they come back from exile. They're called the post-exilic prophets who spoke through those periods. So, that's the timeline and how the Old Testament books fit into that section. Now, what's fascinating about it is you have this amazing thing in the Old Testament which covers thousands of years from creation to the book of Malachi, which is basically the end of the Old Testament and the end of the historical record of the Old Testament. A span of thousands of years. Then you have 400 silent years then, when you start the New Testament, coming on the New Testament side, you have the story told in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then, of course, the book of Acts is its own thing. What you have here in the New Testament is you have basically less than 100 years of history concentrated into those 27 books. Isn't that remarkable? Less than a hundred years. The Old Testament deals with thousands of years. The New Testament, less than a hundred years. Again, you have the historical books of the New Testament. Those are the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Those are the three, we call them synoptic Gospels because they basically see the life of Jesus the same way. And then comes the Apostle John who says, you guys did a good job telling that story let me tell you about some of the stuff that you left out. And he writes the Gospel of John. So then you have the Gospel of John, and then you have the book of Acts, which is really part two to the Gospel of Luke. The book of Acts, which we're studying on Sunday mornings right here and right now. I told you in our first session that Jesus established what you might want to call a new covenant community. That's what we see happening throughout the book of Acts. It's the growth of the new covenant community. It's the way that the Holy Spirit worked in and through the new covenant community. It's what God did to expand the new covenant community. But let me tell you something. That new covenant community needed a lot of encouragement. It needed a lot of instruction. It needed a lot of help. And that's where we come into the letters of the New Testament. First, you have the letters of Paul. The letters of Paul were written, for the most part, to specific churches and Christians. That means they were divided into travel letters, prison letters, and pastoral letters. Those are the three different categories of Paul's letters. Then you have the general letters. Those are the ones in the darker color down there, Hebrews all the way through Jude. Those were not written to specific congregations, but more to Christians in general. Now, sometimes people call those the Catholic epistles. If you ever hear that, hear that don't think that's anything strange. They're just using the term Catholic in its classic usage. Catholic means universal, non-specific. You could say that you have specific and you have Catholic. That's just simply what the word Catholic means. And all their meaning is that these are the general letters, the general letters not written to any specific individual or a church. That's how we can understand them for the most part. So again, back from the top, you have the historical books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then including Acts. Then you have the letters, those two groups taken together. And then you have the outlier at the very end, the prophetic book of Revelation that gives hope and guidance for the future of the New Covenant community, helping them to know what's going to happen and how they can prepare for it. So that's sort of a walk through the flow of the, Old Test the New Testament, but how would you walk through on a timeline of the New Testament? Well, let me kind of do it in this very simple way. You could say that it all begins chronologically in the New Testament 
with the events surrounding the birth of John the Baptist. Remember, it's his birth that comes before the birth of Jesus. So first you have the events surrounding the birth of John the Baptist. Then you have the events surrounding the birth of Jesus Christ. Then you have a few bare mentions of the boyhood of Jesus. Then a fast forward to his adulthood. Then we pick it up with Jesus being about 30 years old and beginning his ministry, which lasted around three years. I say around three years because one of the interesting aspects of biblical chronology of the New Testament is to try to figure out, does the New Testament describe in the ministry of Jesus three Passovers or four Passovers? For Bible chronology geeks, you can start a pretty good argument over that one. And I don't know if I can decide it concretely one way or the other. Whether there are four Passovers described in the ministry of Jesus or three. But we know that the period was about three years. And what did Jesus do during those three years? Well, he taught and he trained his disciples. He taught the multitudes. He taught them about the kingdom of God. Jesus healed the sick. He raised the dead. And he showed authority over the created order. Jesus confronted and exposed religious corruption. But we all know this that the most important work that Jesus Christ did, it was not his teaching as great as that was. It was not the miracles that he did of healing and of creation as great as those were. It wasn't his confrontation of religious corruption as wonderful as that was. No, the greatest thing that Jesus Christ ever did in his own work was to be the sacrifice for sins that humanity needed at the cross. His death, His burial and His resurrection perfectly satisfied the wrath of God and the satisfaction of God in every dimension and as absolute evidence that the price was paid and that He was completely victorious over sin and death, He rose from the dead and displayed His resurrection body to all who would see. This is the most important work that Jesus did. This is the most important work of all the Bible, the center of redemptive history, what Jesus did at the cross and the empty tomb. Then, 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus ascended into heaven in full view of his disciples who watched him leave earth and rise into heaven. Now, his trained disciples were left behind to carry on the work. And once they were filled with the Holy Spirit, the number of disciples multiplied. Multiplied exponentially, first in Jerusalem and then all over the Roman Empire. And they multiplied despite severe persecution. And what the New Testament tells us from the book of Acts on is it tells us the story of the progress and the multiplication of Jesus' disciples along with the wisdom and the guidance that these early disciples needed. And then finally, you could say this, that during the days of His earthly ministry, Jesus spoke often of His return. Are you aware of that? Jesus spoke often of His return. And The book of Revelation is given to us to describe in powerful and meaningful ways what that means for us and how those events will unfold in the very end of ages. That's sort of like a capsulization of the timeline of the New Testament. But don't miss the point. From beginning to end, what... Or maybe I should say, who is the point of the story? Jesus himself. As it says prophetically in the Psalms, Jesus came forth saying this, in the volume of the book it is written of me. 
The Bible again and again has a way of pointing towards Jesus. And this should not surprise us because of where we began this study. Remember that from Ephesians chapter 1 verses 9 and 10? What's going to happen at the end of all things? Everything will be gathered together or summed up in Jesus Christ himself. He is the answer to everything And God doesn't save the answer just for the end. He's showing Jesus all throughout the scriptures. Jesus is the point. As a matter of fact, let me show this to you. I think in a way that is very sort of vivid to us. You could say that Jesus is in every book of the Bible. Ready? In Genesis... Jesus Christ is the promised Savior, the seed of the woman. In Exodus, He's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, He's the perfect sacrifice. In Numbers, He's the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, He's the prophet like Moses who will come. In Joshua, He's the commander of the Lord's army. In Judges, He's our deliverer. In Ruth, Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. In 1 Samuel, Jesus is the ultimate prophet, priest, and king. In 2 Samuel, he's the son of David. In 1 Kings, he's wiser than Solomon and the ultimate builder of God's temple. In 2 Kings, he's the prophet greater than Elijah or Elisha. In 1 Chronicles, he's David's ultimate royal descendant. In 2 Chronicles, he's our reigning king. In Ezra, he's the priest proclaiming freedom. In Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of everything that's broken. In Esther, he's the morning star, the protector of his people. In Job, he's our ever-living redeemer. In Psalms, He's our shepherd. In Proverbs, Jesus is our wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, He's the meaning of our life. In the Song of Solomon, He's the loving bridegroom. In Isaiah, He's the suffering servant. In Lamentations, He bears God's wrath with His people. In Ezekiel, He's the glorious Lord. In Daniel, He's the fourth man in the fiery furnace with his people. In Hosea, he's the faithful husband. In Joel, he's the outpourer of the Holy Spirit. In Amos, he brings justice to the repressed. In Obadiah, he's the judge uh, of those who would afflict God's people. In Jonah, he's the greatest missionary. In Micah, he's the ruler of the world from Bethlehem. In Nahum, he is our stronghold. In Habakkuk, he is our watchman. In Zephaniah, he's the mighty one who saves. In Haggai, he's the desire of all nations. In Zechariah, he's the one who's pierced. In Malachi, he's the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. Pause here between Old and New Testament. In Matthew... He's the Messiah who's the king of the Jews. In Mark, he's the Messiah who's the servant. In Luke, he's the Messiah who's the son of man. In John, he's the Messiah who's the son of God. In the book of Acts, he's the ascended Lord of his church. In Romans, he's the righteousness of God. In 1 Corinthians, he's the wisdom and the power of God. In 2 Corinthians, he is strength perfected in weakness. In Galatians, he is our liberty. In Ephesians, he's the head of the church. In Philippians, he's the bondservant who laid aside his rights and privileges. In Colossians, he's the creator and preeminent over all things. In 1 Thessalonians, he's our comfort in these last days. In 2 Thessalonians, he's our returning king. In 1 Timothy, he's the savior of the worst sinners. In 2 Timothy, he's the one mediator between God and man. In Philemon, he's our benefactor. In Titus, he's our blessed hope. In Hebrews, he's our perfect and sympathetic high priest. In James, he's our Lord of glory and the source of living faith. 
In 1 Peter, he's our chief shepherd. In 2 Peter, he's the beloved son. In 1 John, he's the source of all fellowship with God. In 2 John, he's God come in the flesh. In 3 John, he's the source of all truth. In Jude, he's the one who's able to keep us from falling. And in the book of Revelation, you know he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He's the conquering king and he's the one who makes all things new. That's Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. Now let me tell you something. That's the best story ever. You can't have a story that competes with that. And on these Sunday nights, we're going to look at that story mainly from two separate angles. First, we're going to look at it all topically, with different topics of foundational truth from the Bible. So, we're going to take a look on Sunday nights, again, the first Sunday of every month for the most part, the truth about the Bible, the truth about God, the truth about Jesus Christ, the truth about the Holy Spirit, the truth about angels and demons, the truth about man and sin, the truth about salvation, the truth about the church, the truth about God's judgments, and the truth about the end times. But then, in the second part of each Sunday night, we're also going to take a look at the Bible in its parts. So on Sunday night, we're going to get an understanding of the books of Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament, of the historical books of the Old Testament, of the wisdom books of the Old Testament, of the major prophets, of the minor prophets, of the gospels, of the letters to the early Christians, and then to the church era, the missions era, and the things to come. That's what we're going to look at together here on Sunday nights, the first Sundays of every month. I think it's going to be awesome. I hope you can join us for each one of them. So, let's pray. Zach's going to come on up with whatever questions he has, if there are any questions. And then we will conclude with a song here this evening. Father in heaven, first of all, we thank you that you have made such an amazing story greater than any of our comprehension. But then secondly, Lord, that you have so graciously allowed us to have a part in this story. We're amazed by it, Lord. What a beautiful, powerful thing that you've done. We simply stand in awe and praise you for it. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Amen. Zach, what do you got? Thank you, Pastor David. We really appreciate it. Uh, For everyone who texted in questions, we got a lot of them. And so here's what I'm going to do. If you ask several questions, I'm going to go through one of your questions. And if it's not uh, 10 p.m. by that point, um, I might get back to the other ones. But uh, I figured just one one question uh, per phone number that I got here. Um, A first real easy layup question for you. All right. What translation do you use and which would you recommend to new or non-believers if they were being introduced to the Bible? Uh, I use the New King James Bible. Uh, I think it's a very good translation. I like what's behind the New King James Version. It's memorable to me, the phrasing of it. There's a lot of reasons why I like and prefer the New King James Version. The ESV is very similar to the New King James Version. To me, it's so similar that I don't see any reason for me to switch to it because it's so similar. If I were to recommend a Bible for a brand new believer, I do like the New Living Translation. Mm. I think that that is a super easy to understand Bible. When I first got saved, Greg Laurie was preaching at Calvary Chapel Riverside in the mid-1970s. They put a living Bible in my hand. The new living translation is way better than the living Bible as a translation goes. 
And I really recommend that to people who want like a first buy. Awesome, awesome, wonderful. Um, the second question is when, in referring to act one, um, what did you mean when you mentioned the best possible world? And I'll move over here so you can address well, the crowd. People can talk about the ideal world. Um, if you want to go fast forward to the best possible world, heaven. That's the best possible world. And, and there's people say, well, why can't we have that right now? And, and God has worked out a plan where basically he says, no, heaven's not going to be the starting point. Heaven's going to be where we get. In, in other teaching I've done on this, what I do is I make a comparison or a contrast between, okay, I, I, I was asked to, or excuse me, I, I made a contrast or a comparison between the world of innocence and the world of redemption. And many people think that the ideal world would be the world of innocence, Adam and Eve in the garden before anything fell, but what we have in heaven is going to be greater than even what Adam and Eve have. God's goal is greater than the world of innocence. It's the world of redemption. So really, I guess it's the divine best possible world, heaven, but that's the world of redemption, and that's where God's taking us. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Um, another question we have here uh, is in Genesis 3.6, um, or we'll do this, in Numbers 15.15, 15, it says, um, why does God speak saying uh, that this shall be an ordinance forever when he knew Jesus would come and remove the need for a sacrifice? So the passage, Numbers 16, 31 through 33, this passage, um, or sorry, that was uh, several questions. So he says that he will have his ordinance forever in Numbers 15, 15. Um, why would he say it's forever when he knew that Jesus would then bring a new covenant? I'm looking here. Numbers 15, 15. Mm -hmm. One ordinance shall be for you of the assembly and for the stranger who dwells with you and the ordinance forever throughout your generations. As you are, so shall the stranger be before the Lord. One custom shall be for you and the stranger who dwells with you. One thing I would notice here is that God is speaking specifically to Israel here, and it really doesn't have to do there in verse 15 with the sacrificial system at all. It has to do with how they were to celebrate Passover. And Passover was to be a perpetual celebration and how they should do it even with strangers who were in their homes. Mm. So the commemoration of Passover is not a new sacrifice, but it's simply a commemoration of what they had when they came out of Egypt. Wonderful. So I, I would say, but again, if you want to talk about that, there, there are passages which speak of those things, not in um, enacting a sacrifice again, but in simply commemorating a past sacrifice. Wonderful. Thank you, Pastor. Um, another question is, if the Bible... if if the Bible is one story, why do some claim that the Old Testament describes a life under the law while under the New Testament, life is lived under grace? Did grace only show itself when Jesus was presented as man? Grace is there in the Old Testament, but make no mistake about it, what the Bible says. In John chapter 1, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth by Jesus Christ. Grace is not absent from the Old Testament, but it shines forth in much greater glory and power in the New Testament. And remember this, you're talking about a fundamental difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The New Covenant fulfills all that from the Old Covenant and is, gives us a new grounds of approach before God. Yes. So uh, another question, I'm using this mic because there's interference there. Uh, in Luke, why does Jesus sometimes tell those he healed to tell, uh, sorry, got to rephrase this. Why does Jesus sometimes tell people to not tell anyone when he heals them? They're like, hey, hush, don't tell anyone. When Jesus came to Israel in the first century, they were expecting 
and longing for a Messiah. But they wanted a political Messiah and a military Messiah. Jesus had to be very strategic in the way that he revealed himself to not get the fervor of the crowd whipped up too quickly. And so, to not get the messianic fervor of the crowd whipped up too quickly because they didn't, until Jesus could more properly teach them what to expect in the kind of Messiah he was, he had to do this according to timing. And so it was to not let this messianic, you might call frenzy, come before it's time. Yeah, that makes sense, absolutely. Uh, Another question is, uh, it says, I assume the three continents the Bible was written on our Europe, Asia, and Africa, is that so? Yes. <laughs> Which books were written in Africa? Uh, what you could say, uh, parts of Exodus were written in Africa, mm. right? Parts of Exodus happened in Africa, there, in the, in, yeah. in the African continent, in mm. Egypt. Then, of course, most of it's in Asia. That's where Israel is, in the continent of Asia. And then you have some of it written in uh, Europe, some of the Pauline letters. Great. Written Wonderful. there, yeah. Um, another question says, could you clarify 2 Samuel 7.14, if you want to go there, uh, I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him. So God knows his son Jesus and, know, and, and knew him, um, the past tense and the present tense there, but also the chastening aspect. Does he chasten Jesus? Here's one of the fascinating things about so many Old Testament prophecies is they are prophecies with what you might call a dual fulfillment. They speak to a sooner imperfect fulfillment and then a more distant perfect fulfillment. And there's aspects of the prophecy that can be greater or lesser according to that. Now, the immediate fulfillment to God's promise to David was Solomon. Solomon sinned. Solomon sinned bad. God did not take his mercy from him because of the covenant that he made with David. But even with Jesus, Jesus did not sin. We all agree on that? Please nod yes. But he was treated and chastened as if he was a sinner on the cross. And God did not take his mercy from him. So we see a fulfillment of that principle in both aspects, both with Solomon and then with David's greater son, Jesus Christ. Mm. Amen. Amen. Uh, would you mind clarifying those 400 silent years between the Old Testament and the New Testament? What was happening between Malachi and Matthew? What was happening was big things were happening in the world with the Greeks having rulership over, well, the remnants of Alexander the Great's empire having uh, rulership over the land, the area of Israel through the different dynasties, the Ptolemaic dynasty in Egypt, the Seleucid dynasty of Syria, their battles back and forth. And emerging from that was the time of the Maccabees. These were Jewish revolutionaries that established for a brief time an independent Israel in a time when the other bigger powers were fighting amongst themselves, carving out their own little independent Israel thing for a period of time until the Romans came along and said, "Uh, we're in charge now. And the Romans took over and established their leadership. So that transition from Persian to Alexander the Great to the remnants of Alexander's empire to independence in a brief way under the Maccabees, to under Roman dominion, that was the whole progression through those 400 years. Mm -hmm. Another question regarding a long time, not as long as 400 years, what were the Israelites doing out there in the desert for 38 years? With a qualifier, that seems like a long time. It was a long time. Uh, To not sound cute about it, they were dying. Mm. God said... You're a generation of unbelief. You can't enter into the promised land. When your generation of unbelief dies out, I'm going to allow a new generation that will trust me to enter into the promised land. Hmm. So basically, they were waiting to die. 
That sounds ugly, doesn't it? But that was the price of their unbelief. Look, when they came away, that great covenant that we heard about that God made with them, they leave Mount Sinai, they go on their way to the promised land, they get up to the threshold of the promised land, and God says, let's go. I'm condensing a lot here, you understand that. God says, let's go, and the people of Israel say, I don't think you're going to have our backs in this thing, God. We don't want to do it. Hmm. And God says, really? After all I've done for you? You don't believe that I'm going to be with you and and help you conquer these people into the promised land? And God says, okay, fine. Then you, you generation of unbelief, you can die in the desert when you're dead and gone. Then a generation that will believe me, you guys will enter into the promised land. Hmm. Hmm. That's rough stuff, isn't it? That's the price of unbelief. Well, we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up with this question, and we'll invite Jason up um, while you're explaining the answer. Why is Jesus called slash referred to as the Son of Man? Oh, that's a good one. I believe that the Son of Man is a very strategic title of Jesus. Do you remember what I was talking to you before about this messianic frenzy that was just kind of always below the surface there in the first century when Jesus was doing his ministry. Jesus chose this title because, number one, it has associations of glory going back to prophecies in the book of Daniel, but it didn't have those frenzied associations in that time that the other people were looking for. So he strategically chose a title that was associated with glory from Daniel. Daniel says he saw one like the Son of Man coming in glory and power, but it didn't have the popular associations at that time that would trigger the messianic frenzy that Jesus wanted to avoid until the time was right. Now, if you want to talk about that messianic frenzy, you know when Jesus kind of said, okay, let it go. Triumphal entry. That's when Jesus said, okay, we can do it now. But until that time, he was holding it down until that strategic time. Okay, good?